Good morning and welcome to our webinar this morning. And our webinar today is What About the Fine Print? How to Make Your Move to Portugal with Confidence. Thank you for joining us. My name is Christina Hipsley uh, from the Portuguese Chamber of Commerce in the UK. Many of you will know me already. And today our webinar is on Thursday, the 23rd of September, 11 a.m. And we're here to help. And we're uh, just waiting for all our participants to um, arrive in the webinar. I can see the numbers streaming in right now. Thank you for joining us and it's a pleasure to have you with us. So uh, without further ado, we're just letting a few more participants into the webinar and the numbers are rising. I'm delighted to see how popular the subject is. Uh, the numbers are rising as we speak, I can see them. Okay, fantastic, right. We're going to kick off. So welcome. Uh, what about the fine print? How do you make your move to Portugal with confidence? It's Wednesday the 23rd of September 2021 here in London and my name is Christina Hipsley. I'm the general manager of the Portuguese Chamber of Commerce in the UK and throughout the year, some of you will know this, the Portuguese Chamber in the UK runs our Moving to Portugal events live and virtual. Today is one of our virtual events, obviously, but in normal times we always do live events as well and we hold them in the UK to help you find out all about your move to Portugal. Now, just to let you know, we have good news. Uh, in the last uh, 10 days or so, we have managed to organise the next live edition of the Moving to Portugal show and seminars. It'll be in central London, on Thursday the 21st of October at our usual venue in the Pistana Chelsea Bridge Hotel, Central London. It's uh, just south of Sloan Square. Uh, all the details are on movingtoportugal.org.uk and um, we hope you'll come down and see us. We're open from 11 a.m. till 9 p.m. We'll be there all day. It'll be a smaller show than usual for obvious reasons, COVID, the big C. Um, but we are making it as safe and secure for you as possible. Uh, we will have less exhibitors, so we've got smaller numbers of visitors coming uh, because of uh, we want to make it as secure as possible for everybody. So uh, uh, come down, have a look at movingtoportugal.org.uk. Over 6,000 people have attended our live events in the last three years, obviously not so many in the last 18 months, but uh, we've learned a lot during that time about what sort of questions you all want answers to. So you're here to meet our speaker. Just before I introduce our speaker, uh, a, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we expect this webinar to last no longer than 30 minutes. Uh, John and I, uh, our speaker and myself, will uh, have a, a, a conversation between ourselves where he will tell us about himself and answer some questions from me. And then we're going to take questions from the audience. Obviously, that's what we're here for. Please put any questions uh, into the questions box or the chat box is actually easier uh, here on the bottom of the screen, as you can see, and we will come to them um, as soon as possible. And I can see people are already starting to comment in our chat box. And that's great. These sessions are always very interactive, but we will leave it at 30 minutes. So uh, you uh, can always talk to John later. We'll tell you how to do that. So let me introduce our speaker. Now, um, how can you make your move with confidence? Now we have today invited our chamber member, John Mather, who is the CEO of Emigre. Now Emigre is a complete relocation service for British citizens now. Um, and lots of you British citizens want to make the move to Portugal and you want information on uh, lots of the different aspects of um, how that might work. So John, before we get into some of the questions, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Why are you here with us today? Well, I was doing work with you some years ago on Portugal um, and decided to learn about the way in which the tax and the immigration service worked. Um, so much so that I've, we physically came out to Portugal in uh, 2016 for the third or fourth time okay. and decided that we would buy a holiday home in uh, Madeira. When the pandemic struck, uh, we brought forward our 
plans to move to Portugal. And on the 21st of March, 2020, we came here permanently. Um, tell, so us, tell, tell us, John, just before we get into what you're doing in Madeira, tell us a little bit about your professional background and what, uh, why Portugal appeals to you as a result of that. Because I know you have a long career in uh, financial planning and uh, investment management behind you, which I think um, is uh, one of the big reasons why you find Portugal so attractive. Tell us a little bit about your career and, and what brought you to the point you are now. Well, well, this is my 50th year in the, the wealth management business. And um, I, I, I sold my first business to Prudential back in 1988, but then ran a business with a relatively small number of clients, 19 clients. And we managed about 600 million uh, for those clients. It was an interesting um, career. Um, I will f I'm now regulated in, in Europe rather than the UK. Um, because um, there's a total mismatch between the regulatory bodies. Um, but we had, I had some fun with that business. It was property bias towards it, um, but we made good money for clients. We had some fun doing it, um, and we touched the lives of people very positively for a number of years. So I carried on doing that. But when I came out here, I noticed there was a gap in the market. Um, for instance, people, when they're buying a house, rely on this acting for the oh apologies are uh, i think john's frozen temporarily oh, john, no. are you back yes yeah, sorry you froze temporarily back. so you, okay. you 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 just to recap for our audience uh, you uh, um uh you were saying that uh you, your professional career in fund management and investment management had a, a some bias towards property investing so you've always understood the property world and the financial background of all that and you've advised a great many people on how to restructure their wealth and, and uh, manage it well in the future but you started to take your own advice in the sense that you did quite a lot of work in Portugal for clients and, so, and realized that uh, Portugal would be an ideal destination for you. Theoretically, you were going to retire, but when you got to Portugal, oh. namely Madeira, where you live now, uh, you realised there was a gap in the market to continue doing what you love well, doing. Well, I think you've got to forget the word retirement. Only, only financial advisors and people trying to flog you stuff talk about retirement. <laughs> really, really, what happens is, is that most of the people I'm meeting um, are interested in changing their lives and their well-being in, in the round. It's the Da Vinci you know, and David's situation, you know, you, Leonardo da Vinci was asked why, how he actually carved that David statue. Yes. And he said he imagined David inside it and he just chipped away at everything that wasn't David. And I find that people coming here are not actually the, the person they want to be necessarily where they are. There are so many constraints. Right. They come here and they're liberated and they be themselves and they can enjoy the wellness of the journey. The other things that fit around that, like the tax benefits, like the pension benefits, all of that side of things, they're actually subsidiary to the main event of actually that third, that third wave, as they call it, of life. I find in people here come here and actually contribute very positively to the community. They make new friends. They spend time inviting family across to have quality time. Um, and of course, the changes make a huge difference if you if you can halve your running costs, because Madeira is about half the cost of running in, in London. Yeah. Um, if you can lower your tax rates, then what does that do um, along with property prices? You know, I sold in Wimpole Street at 17,500 euros a square meter. Ridiculous price. Hmm. Over here, the top of the market is 4,000. Now, you imagine how many fun tickets that releases to do more meaningful things with your life. Right. Um, so forget retirement as a word. I think nobody's really interested in it. They want a better quality of life all around. I mean, I'm back to playing tennis. I'm back to, um, the, for, for instance, the ladies' coffee morning, which oh, morphed right. into the ladies' <laughs> lunch club, which then became the wine tasting club, at which time the guys were invited. Now it's the dinner club. So there's lots of good, interesting people here. Okay. And I'm, finding, I'm finding that those people who um, have been prudent and successful in their life actually have the ability to have those choices and actually they want to get on with life, not as it work. So. so therefore, John, what, uh, what you found when you arrived was that there was a gap in the market for people like you. Am I right in thinking uh, you see your role as the uh, 
as the conductor of an orchestra. Tell us a little bit about that and what your company Emigre does now. Well, we, we, we noticed that, as I said, there was this dis disconnect between, I used to have six estate agency businesses part of my business, um, 78 staff in those. Hmm. Now, I, I, I understand that business, but the responsibility of the real estate agent you're dealing with is to sell that property on behalf of the vendor. Hmm. He's there to put the best gloss on that property he can and not be objective about what you're buying. Mm. And I think we're vulnerable coming here, being new to the, the jurisdiction. We're vulnerable because we don't understand the market. Mm. So what I decided I would do, and I started with a few helping a few friends. We then got a quite a nice write up in the Sunday Times um, and then the Times. So we then started to get more inquiries. So I decided, right, well, what we would do is turn this into a bit of a business, have a bit of fun with it. Um, and that's what we're doing. And um, that's, that's worked very well. Acting on behalf of the buyer, right. finding the location, getting rid of the dross. This last case I've just dealt with, for instance, the chap from near Liverpool, um, busy, got three businesses, very busy all the time, could barely get a week to come and look. Mm. Um, we found 40 properties that were, looked like what he described. We dismissed 30 of them, it made a short list of, of, um, of, of 10, showed him eight of the 10 when he came last week. Um, he loved number three, mm. made an offer, and there we are saving him nearly 100,000 euros on the asking price. And um, I think we've bagged a bargain there. But we found that off market, it wasn't advertised. It and, wasn't advertised. And what other services will you do for him? Because you, you talk about uh, being the manager of an orchestra. Will you also give him advice on the other services he, he will need to do, yeah. like uh, visa or financial well, structures? Or Well, take, take, taking your, your um, conductor metaphor forward, um, I've got to find the principal players for it. And then I've got to make sure that the performance is on song all the time. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, um, we'd handhold through the whole process. Right. Um, we'd brief and introduce a legal professional, a tax professional. Um, we'd make sure we got the appropriate visa. The property conveyance would be probably best in what in the same house. Where I like it where the tax advising firm also has in-house lawyers, so jobs don't fall between stools. Um, we'll open the, we'll get the tax reference numbers. We'll get the local bank account opened. Mm. Um, that's even more important now with the golden visa applications. We need a perfect audit trail of that money. We'll organize the foreign exchange for them. We'll take them around. We'll show them good restaurants while they're here, um, which is the, the fun side of the business as well. OK, so just to recap, John, uh, I think you told me earlier that uh, this business started as helping mates. Then because of the write ups in The Times and The Sunday Times, you started the phone started to ring uh, quite significantly. How many uh, property completions and the attendant services have you actually done in the last year or so? I think you mentioned 14 or so. Tell us a little bit about um, yes, it's what nationalities it's... and what you were doing for them, because Madeira is not exactly all British, is it? It's uh, no, no. several no, nationalities. No, no. no the, um, if, in fact, it'll soon be 15. Um, six properties. We, we actually set up buy-to-let portfolios for some people. Um, because they like property. If you look at the stock market, for instance, today, yeah. it's back to where it was 21 years ago, right? Mm. Now, a property we sold on behalf of clients in London recently, we actually raised 20 times what we paid 15 years ago. So mm. I like property. It does tend to perform better than children with screens playing with your money. Um, and so, so the, uh, the history of this, um, in the last seven, eight months, uh, six yeah. properties were in that buy-to-let portfolio. Um, two were building plots for an American. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one's a visa, uh, it, it was a couple from Holland, um, right. a tax partner of a major, you know, top three tax firm. Uh, we helped him and his wife. Uh, one couple from Hong Kong, we've done the investment visa for them because they really just want to get the passport eventually and don't want the commitment to be here all the time. Right. Um, and then four have been owner occupation, soon to be five owner occupation for the British. Okay. So it's a bit of a mixture. Big and there's actually more interest coming from the States now as well. Now there are some more flights that go directly into the Azores. Yeah. 
Exactly. Now, I'm conscious that the questions are building up for our audience. Let's move to the next slide, ladies and gentlemen. And John is going to talk to these discussion points. So, John, start telling us a little bit about uh, the points that you yeah. want to drive home to our audience today. Uh, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Talk us through a little bit, John, about these discussion points. Well, you've, you've got to. I think these are the important things to look at. Um, you, you've got to convince the Portuguese that you've arrived, mm -hmm. but you've also got to convince the Inland Revenue that you've left. Yeah. It's very important, and it's very important that you start off deciding where you want to be taxed, because fo following on from that very major decision, we can then plan properly the right visa, the right property, um, the right even the right advisors to introduce you to. Um, so that's the that's the, 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 the principal point. And, and people, to maintain that tax residence, there's a bit of a misnomer that creeps in. People talk about the 90 days you're allowed back. That, does, that went out in 2013 with what's called the statutory residence test, right? So it matters how many ties you've got. I'll come on to that later. Um, is it wise to have the property seller's agent to give you property advice? No, it isn't. It isn't. And we've proved it on 14 occasions so far this year. Uh, people are walking away with manageable, measurable profits compared with what they would have done had they not engaged our slogans. Okay. I mentioned this compound improvement model. If you get leverage, if you halved your cost of living, you've, you've maximised the amount of cash released from your property without borrowing. Um, you've lowered your tax rate. Uh, by taking some of the uh, options that are available to you, depending on your professions in the past. I've worked out that I'm actually four times better off on the same capital as I was when I was living in central London. Or okay. putting another way, I could live at the same standard with one quarter of the amount of money. Right. That makes a serious difference to how you can enjoy and free up your, your lives. Um, you've also got to be careful of traps. Um, there are inland revenues very, very commonly sets up traps for us. There's a thing called a temporary non-residence. You're not going to do this journey for, on a short-term basis because if you do it and you're there for less than five, you're here for less than five years, the inland revenue has the right to recharacterize all the things you've done and tax you as if you'd never left. So we've got to be careful that we get it right, not only on day one, but for at least for the next five years. So don't make this thing as a, a one-off, one-year deal. It won't work. So for example, if, if you were a Brit and you went to live in Portugal for uh, several years and halfway through the uh, fourth year, uh, you got sick, very sick for whatever reason, or you had a family emergency and you went back to live, to, to be in the UK temporarily, you're saying that the inland revenue can they're give not, you... They're not sympathetic to your circumstances. It's just a matter of law. They will look at it. And if and they did, they did at least try to make sure that you could recharacterize your incomes. So um, last five years. Having said that, you know the one of the things I found here pleasantly surprised. I think the health service here is superior to the national health service. I've just had all the medical check. I'm 73 now, so I do these annual checkups. The last time I had it done in um, in Chelsea it was three and a half thousand pounds. I've just completed exactly the same things, and in fact, plus an MRI on top just a preventative stuff. Um, I've, I've insurance at 200 pounds, 200 euros a month. I've just paid 320 euros altogether. And I managed to get appointments with doctors within, within 24 hours. I've never been longer and getting a doctor's appointment. They're very pleasant. Okay, charge, they charge me 35 euros for going. So what? The service is great. So in fact, you probably wouldn't have to go back for serious illness, you'd actually probably stay here. The Thank doctors you. and the service, I think, are better. But I think uh, it's clear that um, the, the British Indian Revenue is not to be messed with, and uh, you need to be extremely well advised. Right, let's move on to a couple more questions from the audience. Uh, do you want to move to the next slide, John? Yes, okay. So we'll just talk to the statutory residence test, and then we're gonna take some questions from the audience. And we also got some very good advanced questions from um, our uh, visitors as well so we might take a few of those talk us through the statutory residence test john right well i've, I've produced um 
a, a, a sort of um, flowchart. So if anybody wants to email me that, um, I'll, I'll happily send it to them. But really what you've got to concentrate on coming from the UK is what they called ties. And a tie may, might mean that you've got a UK resident family. You've got substantive employment in the UK, and that's uh, the 40 day rule, 40 days. And a day's work in the UK is three hours spent working. Um, accessible UK accommodation, where you could stay for at least one night. That's, that's what, at another time. Um, present for more than 91 days in the last two previous tax years. Uh, present in the UK or any other country uh, for more than 183 days. So you've got five tests there. Um, for, in, for example, if you had three ties, which is quite common, then in fact, that's where the 46 to 90, 90 days comes in. You could spend that in the UK. If we can get you down eventually to one tie, in fact, you'll be very, very happy to know that um, uh, at one tie, you could spend up to 120 days in the UK, but you're not going to achieve that for at least three years because of the relevance of the last two years on your tax. So it matters your ties, manage your diary, manage your planning, spend more than 183 days in, in, in Portugal. That's six months plus one day. And in fact, if we had no ties, which is rather difficult to do, um, then in fact, we could actually achieve um, 182 days at a push. So yeah. depends on your personal circumstances, your personal requirements, and we've got to just build that and monitor it, build up on that. And uh, do you want to cover a bit more on the possible inheritance tax planning? Well, that goes back to that five year rule again. Um, you, dom inheritance tax is based on domicile and domicile is a rather weird British concept really. Um, and it's hard to give up your domicile. You can have a domicile of choice, but it'll take you about five years to get into that position. So in fact, you've still got an inheritance tax position on, in the UK for say the first five years. So we need to think about that, think about how that's dealt with. Inheritance tax in Portugal um, doesn't exist. There is a 10% stamp duty on death, but you've got forced airship rules, the rules on families. So we have to think about your will because if that forced airship rule isn't what you want, then we have to make sure you choose the jurisdiction of your will correctly. But okay. again, some, it, the devil's there is in the detail and you've got to do this planning hmm. carefully. Okay, we have had a very good question from one of our audience, John, so I'm going to ask it to you now. Are there any signs that the tax implications for UK expats in the UK and also in Portugal will be changing. So what do you think Rishi Sunak might be doing to the Brits in the next couple of years? And what do you think the Portuguese might be doing to the Brits that go and live in Portugal in the next couple of years? Well, in his budget in March, there were 33 consulting documents, which over the years I've learned meant it's draft legislation. Um, and we got more borrowing in England than we had at the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, they desperately need cash. And they will do anything they can do to get. So, oops, John. So, 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 John, you, you foresee significant tax rises in the UK, which I think we can all agree on. What do you think might happen in Portugal? Well, the, these tax breaks that you've got in Portugal are not popular with Brussels. But say, for instance, in Madeira, we, we know that the advantageous 5% corporation tax in Madeira is, is for some, some trades, is there till 20, 2027. Hmm. My personal opinion, I have no inside knowledge of this, um, my personal opinion is that's when I think Brussels will try to look at the, 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 the golden visa type products uh, in some depth. So I use it or lose it. It always is with tax. Mm. Use the advantages you've got when they're there. And then and if it's the beginning of the end, if it's in the Financial Times, forget it, it's over. <laughs> okay um uh what about uh we've got a question here from the audience um yes so we've got a question from zuli karmali uh to you and us do you need if you are uh living in portugal under the nhr do you need to be physically in portugal for the 183 days 
or can you uh, go out, you know, can you travel for work, etc.? During the whole year, you've got to be there. It's not 183 consecutive days. It's 183 in the in the calendar year, hmm. right? Um, but you've got to be there. Yes. Yeah. You can't you can't fudge it. You can't get away. You're on a self-reporting basis. That's fraud. Um, yeah. So not. So yeah. But put yourself in a position where you can't be wrong. Yes. Okay. Speak to the spirit of the Lord. All right, John. We've got a question here from uh, one of our attendees, Stephen. Stephen's asking: um, Should, if you're buying a property in Portugal, should you use a Portuguese or an English solicitor for conveyancing? Portuguese, definitely. A lot of the filing is in Portuguese. It's online, and also I like to use a law firm that has a tax competence within it. So you again you get those some joined up thinking between the two advisors right exactly so you would recommend a portuguese ID, uh, yeah the, the, uh, handling the convincing and the tax at the same time um can you confirm for us what tax is applied to investment and dividend income if you're a brit living in portugal under the nhr well it, this is where this is where the planning before you leave helps if, if in fact you, you're receiving dividends in the in in Portugal when you're resident here, tax resident, then in fact the dividend is re, is what they call um, disregarded income, rather like pensions income is disregarded income in the UK. That's the jargon, and they on dividends they're excluded income in Portugal, so there is no tax on the dividend. The pension now there is ten percent tax in Portugal on the on the pension. Okay. But there again, with the pension, if you're going to take tax-free cash, take the tax residence. Otherwise, you pay 10% on the tax-free cash when you're in Portugal. So get that timing right. That could be expensive. Oh, you mean when you take your 25% out of your pension? Yeah, it, yeah, it might be tax-free in the UK, but it's not tax. If you're a resident in Portugal, you're going to pay 10%. Oh, so you've got to get the timing right. Okay. To get the timing right. It's not difficult. It's just detail. And can you clarify, um, what is the capital gains tax payable on a UK share portfolio if you're a Brit living in Portugal under the NHR? Well, um, I'm going to duck that one because there are, many no, there are many answers to it. I think whoever asked the question, if they'd like to just send me an email, let's have a look at that personal circumstance and then I can, act, act, okay. and I can advise properly. There's right. no general rule you could apply there. Okay. Um, what other questions have we got here? I have got some very good questions actually. Oh yeah, what is the advantage, if any, to own a property in a company as opposed to in my personal name in Portugal as a foreigner? Uh, well, it, it, it's similar to the UK. Um, it, the reason for corporate ownership of properties um, as long as you avoid what's called the eight head charge in the UK, is, is really the, the question of cash flow and tax, because the corporate rate of tax is less than the individual's rate of tax, let's say. Then, in fact, you're going to accumulate in the company faster than you'd accumulate personally. So for long term ownership of property where accumulation is the motivation, then corporate ownership makes sense. If, in fact, you're going to do it on a short term basis, then mm. what happens? Imagine it's in the company in the UK or in Portugal. You're going to make the profit in the company. You pay corporation tax. The change is now in the company. How do you get it out and use it? It's going to come out as a dividend or a salary. Mm. You pay tax again. So it's two, ta two tax charges in a short period is actually pretty poor advice. You were probably better to do it in one, in a personal name. Uh, there is a, a little finesse that we're, we're working on here to get the best of both worlds, but... Um, Again, that's that's something we'd rather do on a one to one basis to make sure it fits the family situation. Um, okay. And just to finish up, because we've done our half an hour, which has flown by, but um, I'm just going to take a couple more questions from the audience. Tell us, John, a little bit about the D7 visa. We've talked about non habitual tax regime, which is one thing is tax. The other thing is residency. And now we'll talk briefly about residency. So residency, if you're going to move permanently from the UK to Portugal, you're probably looking at a D7 visa, aren't you now, now that uh, oh. the UK is uh, post-Brexit. 
Uh, I know uh, Digital Emigre, your, your website there, has a lot of detail on this. Tell us a little bit about the D7. Well, we need another half hour. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, sadly we can't have that. But <laughs> no, no, but the, the, really, I think have a read of the website because all, virtually all the questions are there. And then there's the, the, the facility to, to ask more. And then what, because you've got to do this application starting in your home country, we've then got to probably um, introduce you to the right person where you are to get that done. Or you can actually do it yourself. I mean, a lot of people are just doing it themselves. Uh, right. But have a look at the website. I'm, I'm sorry, it, it would take forever to go through every scenario you think is possible. Yeah. Can we go back to the uh, contact slide, please? Brilliant. Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, but um, just, 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 not, just bang an email out to us. We're very happy to do that. Um, we're very happy to do one-on-ones on Zoom if you if you like. You know, we're a very relaxed business. We don't charge until we until you know what you'd want to do. Okay. Um, and am I right in thinking that uh, you uh, will also advise on? We were talking about you conducting the orchestra. Apart from property searches and uh, advice on tax and everything, you'll also uh, find the right contact for people for foreign exchange, property and car insurance. Uh, bank accounts, yeah. uh, local yeah. tax numbers, because I know you had great, not a difficulty, but you found all that very, very confusing, didn't you, when you first arrived? No, I found that quite a few things were a rip-off. I mean, the, 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 the bank, the banks, the clearing banks, <coughs> it wasn't my retirement they were thinking about, it was theirs, I think. Um, <laughs> they, the, sure. the margin, they say they charge no commissions, but have a look at the spreads. Mm. You know, the spreads are just ridiculous. Uh, so I've, I found a good firm that I could trust that did it in the right way so that when the visas work, we can audit the money going through and attribute it properly when, when the, the golden visa is tested. Hmm. Um, so, yes, we can do all of those things. And, and getting the insurance in the right form was difficult. We've, we've now solved that problem. Um, but we're, we're a relatively small business. We're, we're concentrated just to be the best in, in our specific area. Um, and... Now that, that, that um, Porto and Algarve and Lisbon are out of the Golden Visa programme from the end of the year, um, really, I think Madeira will, will be the beneficiary of that. And I can see prices being, on new de new developments going up now, they're already pricing in price rise, yeah. uh, already yeah. doing that. So that, that will manifest itself in a team. And uh, just before we finish, John, tell us um, very quickly, who is the typical buyer that you see coming to Madeira? I mean, uh, what sort of age group? Baby boomers? What nationalities? Um, well, we obviously because of my bias. Um, oh, John, sorry, you're frozen again. I think it's God's way of telling us to wrap up. Can you hear us? Hello. Hear you, but Hi, John. Yeah, you're freezing okay. a bit. We'll just give it a second, so you might have a chance to answer this last question. Okay, you're still freezing, I think. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I was going to ask John um, who the typical buyer arriving in Madeira is. So I will tell you, I think, what he would say uh, if he's come back to life. Has he come back to life? Can you hear us? No, okay. Um, basically, I think John's answer would be, John, uh, who are the typical people you're seeing coming to Madeira age-wise? In terms of uh, sort of people uh, who are relocating themselves to Madeira. Admittedly, I mean, uh, there's a lot of youngsters as well, because there's a big digital nomad uh, uh, wave uh, going on in Madeira. A lot of young people working remotely from Madeira. Uh, there's a, a lot of internet presence for those guys. But uh, I think John typically sees a different audience uh, of uh, people arriving in uh, Madeira. And I think we've lost him permanently, but I think uh, a lot of them are couples aged 55 plus, uh, predominantly cash buyers. And um, interestingly, there's been a, re a recent influx of, uh, of several people from Hong Kong looking at Madeira and American couples as well. So I think on the basis that the technology has let us down slightly, John, are you there just to say goodbye to everybody? We're here. Yes, John. So I think we need to wrap up. If you'd just like to say goodbye and uh, if people would like to contact you directly, what do you recommend? Just send me an email. 
So the email address is there on the screen for everybody. I do apologize with the connection problems, ladies and gentlemen, but uh, luckily it was only for a few minutes at the end. But um, thank you very much for joining us. And make sure uh, you go to movingtoportugal.org.uk for information about our next events. We look forward to seeing you in London if you can come and see us on the 21st of October. And thank you very much for being with us. Bye bye.